click subscribe, click the thumbs up on our messages, click the little bell. Get your friends saved, get your family saved. I was gonna talk about the chastisement of Israel in the tribulation, and I believe God was directing me towards that, but then midstream, the Holy Spirit said, I want you to preach on something else. I want you to preach on charity, and what charity means, and how important it is for us to change our lives and get our brain and our actions into the groove with what God wants us to do, and that the church largely has forgotten what charity really means. And we think what we know what the word means. I'm going to hopefully change that for you permanently here today. We're going to wipe away the old word of charity and give you a brand new word. So I'm going to talk about this old fashioned concept of charity, old fashioned, not just old fashioned 100 years or 200 years or something that only happens around Christmas time, but something going back to the days of Jesus, something going back even probably right after the fall of man. And we're going to talk about giving, we're going to talk about charity, and we're going to try to change our lives and our behavior to support that. Let's go over to uh, Matthew chapter 19, Matthew 19, and I'm going to pray. Father, I thank you for this word here today. I ask that I deliver it with power and authority. I ask, Father God, that not one word would be robbed from anyone here, anyone watching on television, anyone watching uh, these videos later on. And Father, I thank you that there's no distractions here. I bind up, the, I bind up distractions of noise and people uh, just not hearing what's happening. I bind up those distractions and send them out in the dry places never to return. And I command it done. And Father God, that I would deliver this delightful meal with energy and according to your spirit, in Jesus' name, and all God's people said amen and amen. Matthew chapter 19, starting in verse 16. And someone came to him and said, Teacher, or good master, what good thing shall I do that I may obtain eternal life? And Jesus, in verse 17, and he said to him, Why are you asking me about what is good? There is only one who is good. But if you wish to enter into life, keep the commandments. It's interesting that Jesus notes in his earthly tabernacle that he is not walking in the perfection of his father. He is certainly sinless, but he's not walking in the perfection of never having a human body that has been contaminated with the sin of mankind. In verse 18, then he said to him, which ones? And Jesus said, you shall not commit murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. All right, a lot of things uh, that people just don't have a problem with any longer today, even in the church. And I know I do a lot of uh, talking about the church, but I think a lot of pastors that are watching us right now. There's a lot of pastors watching before they go to their services in the morning. I know of pastors in California that watch our live broadcast before they get up in their own pulpits in California, maybe in other states. I know that pastors that are watching uh, overseas that are watching in different time zones right now, for many of them, it might be two or three o'clock in the afternoon in Africa and in India. They want encouragement to know that they're not alone in making demands on themselves for preaching the right thing to their people, even though times are changing. Can I hear an amen? All right, so you shall not commit murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness. A lot of these things are happening with church people and are being endorsed by church people. Honor your father and mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. How many people, uh, how many parents allow their children not to honor them? Every time we see, I was watching some things on uh, a breaking uh, podcast about something that was uh, made, I think it was in Memphis, Tennessee, maybe some of you saw that, and a brand new thing was brought out there, and because so many parents have not taught their children to honor adults, there have been things going on that just destroyed in two weeks. Something that was brand new, that was built, giant, brand new, very expensive, that was built for the community and already was being torn down and destroyed because the young folks just don't have an honor uh, for 
parents and therefore that honor does, does, there's no honor and that translates into no honor for those of gray hair, no honor for those in leadership. And when we teach our children to honor us, we teach our children to honor leadership in our communities and properly so. And that's missing. So he said, honor your father and mother and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And the young man said to him, all these things I have kept, what am I still lacking? And Jesus said to them, if you wish to be complete, go and sell your possessions and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come and follow me. Now he's not asking him to be impoverished permanently. Once you know how to make money and once God reveals to you and gives you faith in how to make money, if you sell everything and give everything away to the poor, it'll be only a matter of days and weeks, maybe, maybe months before you're starting to feel like you're back on your feet again. Because you, you have your connections, you know who to talk to, you know who the bankers are, you know who the lenders are, you know who the, who the idea people are, you, you've had people in your community working for you. So it's not like it's a permanent curse that he's putting himself under. But he said, just go and try this. It's interesting to note also here that if he asked this of a poor man, the poor man would say, well, whatever, whatever I got, I'll give up if that's going to do any benefit. Because sometimes poor people recognize if you don't have that much. I don't want to say poor people. That sounds like a bad word. People that, do not, that are coming up in the ranks say, okay, I, I think I can give that up for a while. Notice he didn't tell a man that was a family man this thing either. We don't know that he had a family. We don't know that he had children. So we don't know if anyone was going to be affected by his giving uh, to the poor. But I'm assuming for lack of other information and that Jesus would not want to impoverish a housewife somewhere and for her to come out and say, you told my husband to give away everything he has. I don't believe in you anymore. He said, that's not that type of thing either. So, but Jesus is challenging him. Verse 22, but when the young man heard this statement, he went away grieving, for he was one who owned much property. And Jesus said to his disciples, truly I say to you, it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Now the kingdom of heaven is not going to heaven. The kingdom of heaven is operating in the blessing realm here in the earth by using the tools that Jesus gives us. So there are tools, the kingdom of heaven is the operation, the royal operation of heaven through humans, through a human vessel, you and me, through a human vessel in the earth. Let me, let me just briefly, and we'll keep reading here in a moment, but if there is prophecy that needs to be fulfilled, but the prophecy has not yet been given, no one knows that it needs to be fulfilled, and heaven has not yet been warned that that prophecy is supposed to even come to pass. What if we didn't have all the prophets in the Old Testament concerning Jesus? There's thousands of prophecies concerning his birth and his life and his death and his resurrection. Thousands of prophecies. And yet if we didn't have any of them, how would we know that Jesus was the Messiah? We can take it down just to our level in in today's society and say, unless we prophesy, how does the people know to say amen to something positive or something that is going to happen in the future that may have a positive effect either on us individually or the church? We don't know. It has to be spoken out. It has to be done. And Jesus is saying here, it is hard for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven or operate in the revelation of heaven, the royal power of heaven through human agency. And so if we're going to have power in our life, we need to know that there's different ways to operate in it that seem, so we can read this about this rich young ruler and we can say, well, I don't know what he was thinking. Man, he, you know, I've heard some teachers say he would have been the next disciple after Judas was gone. And that might be so. Whatever the, you know, that's conjecture, but I can see one thing that Jesus is saying is how hard it is to enter the kingdom of heaven. In other words, the royal operation of the kingdom here on this earth. Remember what the, our father says, your will on earth as it is in heaven. Your will on earth. God wants his will here. So in order, the only way that his will is going to be established is going to be through you. 
It's going to be through your actions, not through preacher's actions, but through your actions. Your individual actions will determine how much the kingdom of heaven is manifested in the earth. And he's saying, go and do this thing. But Jesus not only stood the natural that the rich young ruler understood, but he also understood the supernatural release of power by doing these things. So that's our introduction. So what he was talking about was giving to the poor. Now, there is a thing out there called philanthropy. And philanthropy means, is generally a term that's only used in wealthy circles. And there are different levels of wealthy circles. And you may not know this, but there's a wealthy circle just above you. And then there's a wealthy circle above that. And then there's another several wealthy circles above that. And they go off in the different directions doing different things. There's a lot of different levels of wealth. And at every level of wealth, you get to a certain level of philanthropy. And so we could say, generally speaking, that a level of philanthropy would be maybe uh, building a hospital. Uh, well, or uh, an individual saying, I want to put up a hospital, I have a lot of wealth. Or I want to establish a sports stadium because I have a lot of wealth. Or I want to uh, pay for the bills of everyone in a town. I read about that happening in Michigan some 20 years ago, that some man came into a town and paid all the back tax bills of everyone that lived in that particular town. That's pretty cool. Philanthropy is generally assumed, and, and rightly so, that it's just done amongst the wealthy, and it's generally done amongst the wealthy to benefit society at some level, but it's more to benefit themselves because there's always some strings attached. They get to have their name on that library. They get to have their name on that school or that university. Uh, they, they, you know, their names are in the public eye, and there's a certain amount of, a little bit of ego attached with that. But it's okay because when we are giving, I think giving to the poor is a scream. I, I, I think there's all kinds of ego attached to it. And if you've never practiced it, then you need to start practicing it. And you're going to see why today. I think, it's, I think it's a blast to give. I think it's a blast to give even to people on our own level. Kathy and I were living in a one-bedroom apartment. Uh, and we had two incidences where God spoke to me and said, I want you to give an entire paycheck away. And the first incident, I believe, if, it was, if I have the order correctly, was just a, I think about two or three weeks before Christmas, we were very broke, living in a one-bedroom apartment, and the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said one of her relatives was living right behind us. Her husband had just recently left her, and the Holy Spirit said, if you really want to be blessed, give away all your Christmas money. Well, we had about $200 saved up. And we weren't very good about paying our bills because we didn't have any money coming in. Uh, so, you know, the bills weren't a problem. They weren't getting paid. Uh, so I went to her and I said, I think God is telling me this. And, you know, she had to go off and, and fight those demons back that were talking to me. And uh, eventually she came back and she said, okay, I, I think that God wants us to do that. And so we went through a process of trying to give her money anonymously what the most amazing thing was that happened out of that, though, is by Christmas time, I think we had like $400 in order to spend on our children, not 200 That would have been all that we would have had just a couple weeks later. So God proved to me, and he did it again while we were in that same tiny one-bedroom apartment later on. And so what I began to understand that there was power in giving. And that there was power listening to God talking about what little wealth that we had. And one of the other things I discovered is this. Philanthropy is for the wealthy. And it generally goes only one direction. It kind of it, it, it's runs downhill. The money runs downhill and that, that's what's supposed to happen. It's that, it's that economic money trail going downhill. But charity goes in all directions. In fact, in the King James uh, Bible, when you get to the love chapter, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, uh, instead of saying love, and the word there in the Greek is agape, which is the framework of love, instead of uh, saying love in the King James Version, it says charity. Well, charity and love really are pretty similar, because if you're walking in love, you're going to be charitable to your fellow man. And you're going to be charitable to your fellow man, not just financially, but you're going to be charitable and forgiving. You're going to be charitable in accepting. You're going to be charitable in their personality. When you go over to their house, you're going to be charitable because their windows aren't as clean as yours. You're going to not make comments about when's the last time you clean your windows. I've heard people come 
you know, come to talk to me, pastor, I went to so-and-so's house, and you wouldn't believe the dirt in that house. And well, I don't need to hear that, right? Where's your charity? Where's your love? Where's your agape? Where's that framework of love that is, you're supposed to be copying from our Father who is in heaven? So charity and love is very, very similar. It has then not charity just doesn't have the flavor of finances, but it has the flavor of just being charitable and loving in a, in, in, under Christ's realm of doing it properly. There's a way to do it and a way not to do it. And so that's what's being talked about here. So here, he was not being asked to be a philanthropist, but to be charitable. And that wasn't necessarily in his scheme. See, see philanthropists, they, they don't give away everything. I was seeing, watching another program, the Nobel, how uh, the Nobel Prize started and the man gave up his wealth and the wife got up at the beginning of this movie and uh, she was speaking in uh, German, I believe it was German, and she was talking about her husband who uh, set up this Nobel Prize thing and but she was still exceedingly wealthy. He didn't give up all of his wealth. He gave up a portion of it and left her enough to live high uh, for the rest of her life, her and maybe the grandchildren after them. And so that's generally what philanthropy is. It gives a portion of their wealth. They get something back for it. They get an attaboy, a pat on the back, their picture in the paper. But charity is, goes many times unseen. And it's not done just by one group of people, but it should be done by all groups of people at every level, even going towards people on our own level. So if you're poor and you say, well, I can't afford to, to give to someone else who's in the same situation as I am, well, maybe you can. Maybe you can because you got God, you got the Holy Ghost, you got Jesus, and they may not. And that gift may break them down to say, maybe I need to look outside myself if it's coming from someone on their own level. Can I hear an amen? amen. Praise God. So I was pondering this thing. I remember when I first gave my heart to Jesus Christ, one of the things I did is I watched this one man that was out of Texas, out of uh, Dallas, Texas. He had a church there and a ministry there. We eventually went to go see him. But he had a program on that I used to get up at 5.30 in the morning and watch. This is when we had rabbit ears and you couldn't record anything. And he talked about all the different times that money was, in, was recorded in the Bible. And then after his program went off the air, I found another man that, his name was Larry Burkett, I believe, and he talked about the financial aspects of the Bible and, and the proper uses of money. And for those of you that are old enough, you might remember his name, because I think he's been dead now for 20 years. But anyway, after a while, I began reading my scriptures, and I began to find out that, you know, you can't hardly read a chapter in the Bible where money and the appropriation, a proper appropriation of that money is being talked about. It's very, very difficult to do. So God is talking to us on prophetic levels, but he also talks to us on natural, feasible, workable levels, things that are practical in our daily life to do, although we may not understand the reason behind it. We don't understand the spiritual reason behind it. So in Judaism, whenever someone is talking about money and you're seeing Jews talking about money, like is going to be talked about here, Jesus being a Jew, his disciples being Jewish, he's, they're living in the land of Israel, uh, a, kind of a Jewish area. And so he's talking about Jewish things from the Hebrew scriptures. And so when you're talking about how hard it is for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven, again, not talking about going to heaven, but to enter into the power and, and the authority of God in the earth, which God wants us to do, the disciples had a really hard time with that because they understood that if you were righteous, if you love God, God would see to it that he would bless you. So we're going to see this here as we continue to read this. Let's keep reading now in verse 23. And Jesus said to his disciples, truly I say to you, it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I say to you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Now, again, he's talking about that royal operation, and he's not talking about a camel passing through, being threaded through a needle, but they had what was known as eyes of the needle, uh, in generally in walls, uh, walls that would protect the city, and it would be enough if you took all the burden off the back of the camel, and you asked the camel to walk on its knees in many cases, not 
all the time, but in many cases, they would crawl on their knees through maybe a 20-foot thick wall, maybe a 40-foot thick wall, and grunting and spitting and making a noise. They get through the other side. It's easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. That's the illusion he's giving there. Isn't it interesting? The camel has to take everything off his back. The rich man should have been taking everything off of his back that he loved, that he was attached to. He should have gotten on his knees and walked. We should get on our knees and walk. And when we begin to do that, then we can start seeing and hearing God's voice more clearly. Amen. And so, charity is a biblically based concept. It has religious values. Uh, it has religious moral values. Uh, it's a responsibility that doesn't come from above or come from attention. It comes from within. And that's what God wants in us. So one of the things that I just read to you in 2 Kings is that charity can break curses that can break all kinds of curses. Now, in this particular case, what do you think that we were probably dealing with in this young, rich ruler? And whatever happened, a lot of times what happens in families as they begin to get empowered, there's a term out there called nouveau. It's a French term, nouveau rich, meaning newly rich. So as people begin to come up out, you know, they're walking in God and the families are being, being to get blessed. One of the problems that can creep in, it's spiritual, can be the spirit of covetousness and the spirit of greed. And the spirit of covetous and, and, and greed may not be on the parents, but it could be on all the children. Or it could be on a couple of the children. And then when you get down to the third generation, it might be on a lot of them because they have a lot of wealth, but they don't know how a grandma and grandpa got it. They don't know how God blessed them by them being obedient to the word of God. And now the whole concept, the religious concept of moral charity is lost. Do you know what the average is for a business? Someone that starts a, a company, you know, individually and becomes the head and master of that company and then it stays in the family. You know what the average is? Two and a half generations be, and that company generally will be lost. It might have to be sold or it just goes out of business because the children and the grandchildren didn't understand the sacrifices, what it means to keep that company operational. They didn't understand the sacrifices, they didn't understand the prayer, they didn't understand the moral driven values of charity. And if you look at some of the biggest companies in America that you've ever heard of, the founders always, especially those that had some value to them, Christian moral values to them, the founders were always gigantic charitable givers. They were philanthropists, but they were also givers. They were charity givers to the poor. I want you to go with me over to uh, Proverbs chapter 11, Proverbs 11, verse 17. The merciful man does himself good, but the cruel man does himself harm. The wicked earns deceptive wages, but he who sows righteousness gets a true reward. He who is steadfast in righteousness will attain to life, and he who pursues evil will bring about his own death. Now, there is something happening here that does not come out at all to the Western mindset, Christian mindset and doesn't come out in the English at all. There's a word here that we're reading, righteous. And righteous or righteousness has a distinct legal term, and that term legally for us in the church, first of all, has two meanings that are associated with one another. Righteousness means that legally we are made right standing before God. We are legally and morally accepted before God's throne. Like it says in Hebrews, come boldly before his throne of grace, asking for mercy and grace to help in your time of need. Come boldly before that throne of grace. How can you do that if you don't have a legal, legal right to do that? Well, we have a legal right through the blood of Jesus Christ. Now, taking it a little bit further, this word here, righteous and righteousness, comes from the word, the Hebrew word zadik. When we talk about it here, it's zadika, which is the feminine of zadik, and zadik or zadek. It's all spelt the same way, and it means, number one, legally and morally right before your God, and number two, legally and morally right to your fellow man. It is almost always translated in any type of Hebrew Bible or uh, 
a Jewish Bible, depending on its application of the word Zadik in that particular sentence in Scripture, Old Testament Scripture, it'll apply either to the right standing of that man before God or right standing before God because of his treatment to his fellow man. But Zadik means charity or it means legally and morally doing the right thing with a charitable view of how God is looking upon what you're doing. So it changes your moral code inside and it changes how you react to everything else that you see around you. How many of you, when you see someone driving up the street, and I don't want to see a show of hands, but how many of you, when you see someone driving up in the street and they're driving you know, a car that's held together with, you know, with bumper stickers, and if they weren't there, it'd fall apart, the bumper's falling off, the, the license plate is hanging in the front, you know that the taillight is out in the back and they probably get pulled over all the time because the, the, the car is just a beater. I used to think before God got a hold of my heart, I used to think things that were not proper. Not to say that I was never there. I've been there many times. But it's interesting when you get out of being in those times and then when you look at someone else that's going through what you were just experiencing two years earlier, how you have a different attitude about yourself. And so you begin to look down. You have a condescending viewpoint of them. And so now I see it and I weep. Sometimes visibly weep. I'm driving my own car and I see someone else going, if they would only know the secrets of giving to the house and the kingdom of God, in six months to a year, they could be out of that situation. See, a lot of times I preach about charity, and I have a few people in Africa, and they like to take advantage of that, and they'll go, well, then give to me. But I've turned around and asked them, you give to me. You give to this ministry. We're blessing you. You give to this ministry. You know, many of these pastors, they can't do it because they haven't trained themselves. They've only, only trained themselves to take, 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 never give, give, give. And that, is, that keeps the spirit of poverty on them and it's only broken by giving. People locally even will ask me, well, you talk about giving here, give to me. Well, what have you given back to God? What have you done for the kingdom? Until you break that spirit of poverty, you're always going to be asking for a fish, even though I taught you how to throw your line out there yourself and get a whole net full. So, Zedekah, in the Hebrew... Zadik and Zadika embodies all that we control and all that we own and all that we are in order to, to give it to our fellow man, including our money. So it has the sense of a moral obligation to give to someone that's in need, even on your own level. Isn't it interesting if I asked you around the room, if I passed out a bucket, you know, ushers pass out a bucket right now, write down what... <laughs> What financial level are you at? I want you to use just really, you know, economic terms, just, you know, non-religious non terms. What financial level are you at? Most people may not know what to say. And the ones that do know what to say, they may turn and look at their other neighbor writing down something they don't know what they're writing going like, well, they're not where I'm at, or they're way above where I'm at. And you know, life fools us. You can have a bunch of loans and three cars in the parking lot and be going from paycheck to paycheck. And you can have an old beater sitting in the parking lot, but uh, pe what people don't know is the reason why you're gone uh, for six months out of a year is you're spending three months in Florida and three months in Canada, you know, salmon fishing, because you have more than enough. So what it, people see and what people mistakenly read is sometimes only the things that are out there in front of them. So we're very judgmental. We judge our neighbors uh, much more harshly than we judge ourselves. But what financial level are you on? Can you answer that question, what financial level do you want to be on? Where do you want God to take you? If you're charitable with what you have, God is going to raise your level. Listen. I, my father, 
who wanted to become a Catholic priest, went to six years of seminary in La Salette, Iowa, changed his mind, got a vision. I like women. Mary. He had nine children. I'm the oldest of them. When I talk to my father to this day, he says, well, I, you know, we, I, I took a vow of poverty when I was, which is one of the things that these priests have to take. A vow of poverty. Well, that's the spirit of poverty. And I don't know what got into my head, but I thought if I was going to be pleasing to God, even though I, I wasn't really exactly saved, if I was going to be pleasing to God, being poor was better to be poor than to be rich, because rich people, they don't go to heaven. That's what I thought. And so I thought anyone that was a little bit wealthier than me must have been in sin, must have been selling drugs to get that money, well, you, know, you know, whatever they did wrong in order to empower themselves with finances. And that's, that's, not, that's not godly either. That's not God. That's not even biblically based. But a lot of preachers out there say, well, anyone that's talking about money and talking about prosperity, uh, they're not preaching the Bible. What Bible are you reading? Because money is all over the Bible, starting in the Garden of Eden. And the gold of that land, the gold in Havilah, was good. Genesis chapter 2, and the gold in that land was very good. Why is God even talking about gold? Because later on, he's going he's to say that you're going to use gold as manna, which later becomes money, our English word for money here today. Manna is one of the things that now, manna is a measurement of that gold. People come to me and they say, well, the Babylonians invented gold or invented money. No, no, no. God invented money. And God had a plan for money. And he had the gold there and the silver there and the copper there. He had all the things there. We can read about it in the first 10 chapters of the book of Genesis. So God had a plan. All right. So I want you to just uh, go over with me. Uh, well, let's go over with me to uh, Matthew chapter 6. Matthew 6. Verse 20, but store for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. All right, so he's talking, if you read back a little bit, he's talking about money in verse 19. He's talking about wealth, money, land, value. Now, then he goes in what looks like a change of a discussion, but this is just simply because we don't understand the words of Jesus and the Mediterranean concept of an eye. But look at this now in verse 22. The eye is the lamp of the body. So then if your eye is clear, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad or evil, your whole body will be full of darkness. And if that light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? Okay, we're going to keep reading in a moment, but when he's talking about an evil eye, what he's talking about is not looking at, at women or looking at men and thinking about sex or, or coveting your neighbor's house. An evil eye is someone that looks on what they possess and they look on it and they don't want to let it out of their sight. I talked to a banker back, I don't know, 20 years ago, 15 years ago, and he said that when that thing was happening in 2007, 2008, I came and sat down in his office and he said, he, he hung up the phone, he said, I've been having a bad day, something to that effect. And I said, well, what's going on? He said, I got, a, I got a guy that's worth $175 million. And he said, the bank stock went down a couple hairs overnight, so he called me up and he, he you know, was really angry about it. And, you know, it's, you know I, I don't know what the number was, but it sounded like his value went down to maybe 174500000 I don't know. But isn't it interesting that when we own stuff, we actually covet what we own and we don't want to give it away. And the only time we want to trade it for anything is when we're trading it for something of visible value. You buy a car, you buy gasoline, you buy food, and you're trading it value for value. What God wants us to do is he doesn't want us to look at those things with an evil eye. He doesn't want us to look at those things as that's all we possess. He doesn't want us to look at these things as possessing us. And many times what we have possesses us, like that rich young ruler, rather than us possessing them and knowing we know the source of supply. And so people get possessed by their possessions. Even poor people get possessed by their possessions. 
Try to borrow the non-working lawnmower from your poor neighbor, and he doesn't want to even give that up. So, well, if I'll, I'll borrow it from you, I'll fix it up, and I'll return it. No, 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 I don't trust you. People are like that. They don't know how to make deals. They don't know how to do things like that. And so God wants us to be able to look at this and then look at someone else in need and cut off a section of it and hand it to them because we see that they're in need, because we have a heart for human beings. We have a heart that, that wants to reach out to them and say, I want to help you. And we don't do it Remember what Jesus said, whenever you, you know, give to the poor, do not do it like the hypocrites do, right? And making, you know, sounding a bell and everything like that and getting everyone's attention. But when you give, give privately so that your father who sees you privately will reward you openly. Amen? Now, let's keep reading. No one can serve two masters, for either he hate the one and love the other, or he be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. Or in some of your Bibles, God and mammon, or God and money. So he's talking this whole section here about whether, are you going to serve that wealth? Is, is it going to possess you, or are you going to possess it? Are you going to have the ability to separate your moral code from what you own? Are you going to be able to say, my moral code says, I can give some of this away. I can do something with this, I can do something. What's your moral code? When I have people write me, and they tell me, I can't give because I'm on Social Security. That's a lie. You just haven't even tried. Your moral code says, I possess this. I won't dare share it without getting something of value back from you. And yet the Apostle Paul said, if we have shared spiritual things with you, is it too much to ask back for material things from you? And the Apostle Paul, being a Jew, understanding the code of wealth. So what's happening if your eye is bad, in other words, if you're greedy, if you have avarice towards what you have, and again, people can be greedy. You can always tell a greedy person by, they say, well, if I had what he had, I would do this. It's almost always, if I had what he had, is almost always an indicator of greed of some form. If you hear yourself doing that, check your spirit, because what you are doing is judging that other person and you're not looking to yourself with what you already possess. See, if I turn this all around and we push everyone over here, and then we fill up this side with everyone I know from Africa and India, and we get all the people that we are supporting right now, and we put them in here, and we have a, we have a, a meeting together, they're going to look at you as like, no matter who you are here, they're going to look at you like, we wealthy Americans, why don't they come over here and help me out? Because what we possess in America is way more than what the rest of the world possesses. So to say that you're poor and you're too poor to give to the kingdom of God or too poor to help out your neighbor is a lie. It's a fabrication. It's what you talk yourself into. It's not even biblically or morally correct. And as long as you do that, you will have the spirit of greed on you. How do you break a spirit of greed? Start giving money away and the spirit of greed will leave your family line. Start giving, and you can't do it once. Say, oh, well, look at God, I gave $10 away. No. The spirit of greed is broken by the spirit of generosity, by the spirit of charity, by the spirit of agape. God's own spirit, God's own heart. Now, jump back with me in chapter 6, and I'm going to start reading in verse 2. So when you give to the poor, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, so they may be honored by men. Truly, I say to you, they have their reward in full. But when you give to the poor, he didn't say if you give to the poor. He said when. Do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving will be in secret and your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And then later on, he talks about your eye. The evil eye is the person, is the individual that follows the money around. <laughs> and this, this happened a long time ago. <laughs> this must be 35 years old now. But I heard a man <laughs> say to me, I was attending another church in the area, and a man said to me, I saw the pastor's wife spending my tithe money on Twinkies. <laughs> when Twinkies are still being sold. <laughs> and I didn't have the heart to say anything to him. And I was so broke. 
I, I, you know, we didn't waste our money on Twinkies. We, were, we weren't even pe- putting meat in our macaroni and cheese for our children. And I, I, you know, I just thought to myself, how stingy can you be that you don't want the pastor's wife to eat Twinkies? And you're thinking that it was your $10 or your $2 that went to that? But many people with an evil eye, they follow the money around. And if they don't like the way it's being spent, then, it, which is a proper thought to think, but an evil eye always has a negative view of how the money's being spent. It's evil eye. It's, like, it's, it's judging the person. And so in, in, what they do is they free themselves from that judgment and say, well, I'm not going to give it all. I don't know how they're going to spend it. Well, that's not your concern if you know where you're given to someone that's in need. If you're given to someone that's in need and you say, well, look at that. They're not feeding their dog. Yeah, but the kids are eating less than the dog. And you don't know that. And so you come around and you say, well, you know, I gave you 100 bucks two weeks ago. Your dog still looks skinny. He said, yeah, but my kids are skinnier. And they needed to go get braces. They needed glasses. They needed to go see the dentist. They, you know, we, your, your 100 bucks lasted 24 hours. Thank you very much. And I'm not being, telling people to be cruel like that, but a lot of times people can't see what's really the need because people that are in need don't want to talk about it. Do you know we've got something that's called an ego? I know you don't have one, but I think I do from time to time. And that ego keeps us from telling people that we're in need. And so most people that are in need won't tell you they're in need. A lot of preachers won't tell you that they're in need. And we all have pride. All of us have pride. We're not, we are not free from it. We just have to control the levels of pride that's in each one of us. And hopefully we can squash it down enough and keep it padded down there for another 24 hours. So, what does charity do? I can tell you that charity breaks family curses. And what we just read, we, we know that giving or charity can break the curse of death. It's, it is literally breaking a spirit. And the Jews understand this. Now, I don't know about modern day Jews, but the Jews that you know, wrote a lot back 2,000 years ago, 3,000 years ago, they understood the concept, the spiritual connection and using your moral code to what you owned naturally. And this is what that rich young ruler had lost sight of. The Apostle Paul talks about this all the time. You know, and, and we look, re, also read in the, in the book of Luke, given it shall be given back to you, press down, Shaken together, run, running over, shall men heap into your bosom. When I, we make, we love coffee, you know, we like the dark French roast. Thank you, Dennis. We love dark French roast. And what I have to do in the, in the morning when I'm making coffee, you know, Kathy and I share that responsibility, is I put it in the coffee maker. We like it rich. Rum. Coffee. Yes. And I shake it down. And I go, we can get some more in there. And put some more in there. You know what being shake, pressed down, shaken together and running over? The first two is doing what I do with the coffee. But the third one, running over, comes from Psalm 23. My cup runneth over. Right? Where you have blessings that are running over. Give and it shall be given back to you. Shaken, pressed down, shaken together, running over. Shall men heap back into your bosom. Once I understood the law of giving and receiving. Then the second law that I had to learn how to do is to learn how to accept gifts from other people. And for some people, that, there's the pride thing all over again, right? We, not only do we not want to ask, but if we're not asking and someone by the Spirit of God comes and says, you know, the, God told me to give to your ministry. God told me to give to your household. God told me to leave these groceries on your step. Then all of a sudden we go, oh, okay, you know, I'm, I'm doing really okay. I'm doing okay. You need to get over that spirit of pride too. Because you need to let other people bless you. I'm going to show it how that works here. Uh, let's go over to uh, Luke chapter 21. Luke 21, verse 1. And he looked up and saw the rich putting their gifts into the treasury. Now, by the way, uh, back then, the, the rich putting gifts into the treasury, there was these um, what looked like horns. They were sometimes in the shape of a fish. It depended on where it was, but it was kind of noisy, and they were made generally out of copper or some brass or some metal. And when they put them down into the throat of this thing, and these throats, they could be turned up and then emptied out. But when 
they put it down in the throat, it made a big clanging sound all the way down. So you wouldn't just put in a bag of coins, you'd empty the bag out. Clang, 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 and it would, you know, it fluted mouth, it would give the beautiful sound of your money all over the temple. And so a lot of wealthy people, you know, used to do that, and everyone's going, oh, they're wealthy, isn't that nice? They're given to God. But that's not what was happening with this poor widow. He saw a poor widow putting in two small copper coins. He can hear them. That's how he knows. And he said, truly, I say to you, this poor widow put in more than all of them, for they out of their surplus put into the offering, but she out of her poverty put in all that she had to live on. She gave even though she was impoverished. So philanthropy is the rich giving downhill. Charity is for us to be giving on all levels. We give to the kingdom. We give to each other. We help each, out, each other in need. The other thing about this is notice that Jesus didn't jump up and stop her. Why didn't he jump up and stop her? because he understood the spiritual law follows the natural law. You give out of all that you have, and she's going to go home like that, like that widow who was, was ready, to, ready to die. We're going to, you know, me and my son, we're just going to die here. And he said, well, bake me a cake first. And then that whole time that famine was going on, she lacked nothing. And she ended up having servants as a result of it. She lacked nothing because she gave the last of what she had to the man of God. God made sure she had an abundance during the rest of that famine. A lot of people don't understand that spiritual connection. And it's hard to understand because everything around us says value for money. Get, get your value. Get your best value for your dollar. And we have a hard time giving even a little bit of money to people. But some of you are very generous, and you're very quiet, and you're, you're very generous with your words, you're very generous with your heart, and, and even out of that portion, some of you are very generous with your finances, but I think everyone should be generous with their finances, because it breaks the spirit of poverty, it breaks different spirits, it breaks the spirit of death off a family. I've, I've, at times, I've seen things happen to our family, and I just decided whether I told Kathy about it or not, I would just write out a check for everything I had. Everything I had. To break a, what I, I perceived as a spirit of something in our family or something on me or whatever in our house. And I can't tell you I always saw a direct connection like that first story I told you. I, I see a lot of connections. I can look back over a period of years and say, how did God raise me up and nothing changed in my life until I started to learn how to give. Not asking people for money, which I couldn't do anyway. I had too big of an ego. But I couldn't ask people for money, but I could give. That I could do. And so we kept giving away, kept giving away, kept giving away. When we were impoverished, and all of a sudden we got out of our poverty. And then we started prospering. And then things happened. One of the things that I re recall happening, we were living in a one-bedroom apartment. And I'm not trying to bring any praise to me because... I'm not that smart, okay? The scriptures are smart. The Holy Spirit is smart. I'm, I'm just an average person. But we're living in a one-bedroom apartment, and Kathy came to me, and she goes, I don't mean to be complaining. But she goes, now, you know, we got a fourth kid on the way here, and don't you think it's time that you promised me a house? You said that we we're only going to be in this place for five years, and I don't remember where we were in that stage. I think we we're up to four years or something like four and a half years. I said, you promised me that you were going to get us in a home and get us out of this one-bedroom apartment. And when I say we were in a one-bedroom apartment, she don't like to remember it or have me talk about it, but it really happened. It really happened. One bathroom, a sheet in between us and the kids at night. It really happened. And all of a sudden, one day, a man came to see me about my age. He said, God spoke to me and said, I'm supposed to design a building for you. <laughs> what? You're supposed to design a building for me? He says, yeah, I got the plans all drawn up. I go, who are you? He goes, well, I live outside of town on a farm, which he did. He goes, he goes I love Jesus, and, and I don't know who you are, Dave, but... God told me to design a building for you. So he rolls out seven pages of professionally printed out blueprints of a 
one story, no basement building that was 60 by 40 or 80 by 40, 60 by 40. It had windows, it had a garage, had everything. Six, no, that was in December. That was in December of 1987, I think, or 1987, whatever the year was. And a month later, I was driving, and the Holy Spirit said, I want you to buy this piece of land. I, you, many of you have heard the story without me going into it, and I didn't have any money. And then a man I was selling to came and said, Dave, what are you up to? I said, well, you know, I do this and I do that. He said, Dave, what are you up to? I go, do, do this, I do that. And I thought, this man's getting awfully personal. I think I need to leave. I really was thinking of leaving, standing up, just leaving. He says, goodbye, I don't know who you are. And he goes, no, Dave. He goes, I'm a Christian, and the Holy Spirit's telling me to ask you what you're looking at. I said, well, I'm looking at a piece of land over here. He said, go and negotiate for the land. I'll secretly give you the money. And within two months of, I believe, it might have been three, of Kathy asking me, don't you think you deserve to get me into a place because you promised me? I had plans for a building. I owned the land without a, going to a bank. And now we were moving and moving under construction. By this time, when anyone came from India or Africa to town, and I heard they were preaching in a church, if I had $500, which was a lot of money to me, if I had $500, I would go and hand them the cash in an envelope and say, don't tell the preacher. Because a lot of these preachers didn't know me, and if they did know me, they thought I was a loudmouth Christian, so don't get them angry at me, just here, keep it quietly. I did that regularly, sometimes every month, because there were, at that time in, in my, our town, a lot of people were bringing in foreign missionaries and, and foreign preachers. So it was easy to keep giving, and I, every time I gave, money would kind of just show up. I can't say that I could, I could follow the money trail. So just a couple months, I have a building designed for me that, I, that should have cost me ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000. It's a beautiful blueprints. All of a sudden now I own a piece of land, 27 acres, that someone said, I'll back you. Don't tell your banker anything. By August of that year, we were in that building, and what was the most amazing thing? The man that brought me the blueprints, he said, well, when you go to build it, you please hire me to be your contractor, which we did. He ran out of money. He said, I'm sorry, I got a garage up here for you, but all the dirt's down here. And you're gonna, you can't use your garage because I just misfigured the fill and we're short. And he named the cubic yards. It was, you know, several thousand cubic yards of fill, which is a lot of fill. The day he's telling me that, he leaves me. I, I didn't know what to say to him. He leaves me and he goes back to the project. And he calls me up. He goes, Dave, you got to get over here real quick. I go, what's the matter? It sounded like someone was injured. He goes, no, you got to get over here real quick. So I come up there. And there's a line of dump trucks up in front of our property on the main drag. And I can see that there's fill in the back of them. I drive in, I drive around, and the road contractor comes up to me and said, Mr. Gonzalez, uh, we were tearing up the street down here, and we wanted to take that sub-base fill. We saved that, and we were bringing it down to a lot in Madison, but it had been so wet for the last three days, our first dump truck got stuck in the gate. We can't dump it, and we can't pull them out. We need to dump it now. We have 120 men standing by that I'm paying to do nothing. Would you let us dump the fill here? And if you do, we'll put it anywhere you want to. We'll compress it and compact it. And for what is supposed to be under a road at that time, on that particular road, was three inches, according to his description, we ended up having 10 feet of by the end of two days. Come on, church. That deserves a clap. And that was all because we were being charitable. So we went from abject poverty to looking like someone claimed that we owned one end of town because we built a building outside of town. Someone came and said, well, you think you own the whole end of town? Thinking like, eight months ago, I was in a one-bedroom apartment. I haven't even adjusted to living here yet. Never mind getting all pride-filled about it. Are you with me? You can give your way out of a curse. You can give your way out of death.
Well, we're going to read uh, three more. Go over with me to uh, Proverbs 21.13. Proverbs 21.13. He who shuts his ear to the cry of the poor, or he who closes his ear to the cry of the poor, will also cry himself and not be answered. We have opportunities to give daily. And again, it's not foolish giving. This is not giving. I mean, I, there's a lot of different rules about giving. If a man will not work, neither should he eat. So if I give to a man and he still will not work after I give to him, I'll cut him off. I'll say, get yourself on, out there and get in the street and get yourself a job. Because there is a curse on the lazy man and I'm not going to support another man's curse. If a man will not work, neither should he eat. That's New Testament, by the way, the Apostle Paul, not Old Testament. So I've done that to many men. Well, well, I, I just need the money. You won't even get up at 8 o'clock in the morning, never mind be at work like all your other, all your other neighbors at 8 o'clock in the morning. That's laziness. And you should never fund laziness. If you want to give to them once, fine. But some people just think that you should fund other people's wicked, lazy spirit. You don't fund that. You know what happened to the, you know what happened to the prodigal son? The prodigal son got hungry. When he got hungry, he came to his senses. So, you know, I'm, you know, I'm feeding pods to these swine, and, I don't, I'm, and I, you know, I'm not even allowed to eat this stuff. How many people are eating to their fill in my father's household? And so he came to his senses. Hunger will have you come to your senses. The next thing is over in Jeremiah. Turn with me there to Jeremiah 34, verse 8. The word which came to Jeremiah from Yahweh after King Ezekiel made a covenant with the people who were in Jerusalem to proclaim release to them, that each man should set free his male servant and each man his female servant, a Hebrew man or a Hebrew woman, so that no one should keep them, a Jew, his brother, in bondage. And all the officials and in all the people who obeyed and who entered into the covenant, that each man should set free his male servant and each his female servant, so that no one should keep them any longer in bondage. They obeyed and set them free. But afterward, they turned around and took back the male servants and the female servants whom they'd set free and brought them into subjection for male servants and for female servants. And the word of Yahweh came to Jeremiah from Yahweh saying, Thus says Yahweh, God of Israel, I made a covenant with your forefathers in the day I brought them up out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage, saying, At the end of seven years, each of you shall set free his Hebrew brother who has been sold to you and has served you six years and you shall send him out free from you but your forefathers did not obey me or incline their ear to me. And although recently you had turned and done what is right in my sight, each man proclaiming release to his neighbor and you made a covenant before me in the house which is called by my name, yet you turned and profaned my name and each man took back his male servant. And each man his female servant, whom you set free according to their desire, and you brought them into subjection to be your male servants and female servants. Thus says Yahweh, you have not obeyed me in proclaiming a release to each man his brother and each man his neighbor. Behold, I am proclaiming a release to you, declares Yahweh, to the sword, to pestilence, to famine, and I will make you a terror to all the kingdoms of the earth. One of the ways that I've told people to give and I've, I, that I know of, I've, I've done this a number of times, I've only seen it, uh, people listen to what I told them a couple times. I've gone to families and said, you've got bondages in your family. You've got drug bondages, you've got alcohol bondages, uh, you've got laziness bondages. What you need to do is set a gift before Yahweh, right here. Set a gift before the Lord. A gift to break all the bondages in your family. You see, he said every seven years, we're to, we're to release people from their bondages. It's something that Kathy and I practice. If we, someone owes us money going back previous seven years, probably sometimes it only goes three or four years, sometimes five years, we literally cut them loose. And most of the time, if we're still, if we're still in some sort of a communion with them or we're talking to them, we let them know that that's been wiped off. And it amounts to a lot of money. How many of you have debts that you're holding against people that are 10 years old? Well, you still owe me $600 for that thing back 10 years ago. Release the debt. Release the debt and bondage will come off of your family. Bondage 
will come off your family. And what's the opposite of releasing the bondage? Death and destruction. So by you're giving yourself life, I haven't covered nearly the scriptures I wanted to cover today concerning this. But one of the things that comes with Zadika is life. The righteous man shall save his life, it says in Proverbs. But the word Zadika there is being used of money, of charity. The righteous man shall save his life, shall redeem his life. I read a strange but very, very old Jewish saying concerning Zadika. And it comes out like this, and try to follow it, because it moves weird. It says about a man who was going to work in the rice fields, and he was going over to a swampy area, and one Jew was saying to another Jew, that man's going to get bitten by a snake, and, and he's going to walk out, and he's going to walk in there, and he's going to die, and you're not going to see him coming home. And the other Jew said, not if he's a practicing Jew. And so later on, he comes back out, and the second man is surprised that the man is alive. And then they hear the story that while they were in the rice paddies, they all every day put all their food together, and then they would share their food communally. And one man that was so poor came in one day, and he didn't have enough food. So the other man that was said that was supposed to die, he walked over to the man and made it look like he was taking food into the communal pot of food for lunch. And he made it look like he had given so that other people wouldn't judge him. And it came out that the, the, the Jewish man that, that, that's giving the story or telling the story from a positive angle, he said, this man practiced Zadika to his poor brother, the man working right next door to him, and not to embarrass him, made it look like he was taking food from him when he was just faking it for everybody else in the field. The point being is this, the man saved his own life by practicing Zadika and covering up the poverty of someone that worked right with him, shoulder to shoulder. You want to break curses off your family? I'm telling you, it works. People don't want to hear it. You want to break curses off your own finances? Release debts that are over seven years old. A lot of people keep them, and a lot of people keep debts that have nothing to do with money, but have everything to do, well, you treated me bad when I was, you know... Release the debt. Release it. That's part of the charity you're required to give other people. Release the debt. You don't want to be in debt? Release debt. You want to be enriched? Enrich others. You don't want to be in bondage? You don't like the bondage your family is under? Then give a gift that's a bondage of release to someone else. You don't trust me? Then give it to somebody else. It'll work either way as long as you give it rightly. It'll work any way. It'll work, but release that thing so the bondage is broken off your lineage and off your family. I'm going to close it here in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10. For the love of money is the root of all sorts of evil, and some by longing for it have wandered away from the faith and have pierced themselves with many griefs. Jump down to verse 18. Instruct them to do good, to be rich in good works, and to be generous and ready to share, storing up for themselves the treasure of a good foundation for the future, so that they may take hold of that which is life indeed. Let's all stand. Kathy, would you like to join me up here? You know, if you're watching us uh, live or you're watching us on television, one of the best ways to get out of a curse is to outgive and to approach that curse as if it's spiritual and find out the component that releases that spiritual thing off of you. Amen. Today we talked about the art of giving, the art of charity, the art of zedekah. And if you want to make Jesus Christ your personal Lord and Savior, that's the first thing you need to do. God gave his best gift, his only son, Amen. so that you could have life. Amen. And Jesus gave himself up. So that now, as a result of what he did for you, now he's honored and he sits down at the right hand of the Father Amen. on high. Amen. If you'd like to make Jesus Christ your personal Lord and Savior, just repeat these words out loud and say, Dear Jesus, Dear Jesus come into my heart right now, into my heart right now and make me a new person, a new, person. A, new a new creation. I don't want to be that old person anymore. Thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross for me so that I don't have to die for all the things that I've done wrong. In Jesus' name, 
Amen and amen. Now, if you just made that decision for Jesus Christ, write us here at David Gonzalez Ministries, P.O. Box 847, Lake Delton, Wisconsin, 53940. And I want to send out this free little booklet to you, Is the Bible for Real? No charge whatsoever, but I do want to hear from you. And, you know, we give God honor if we heard from you in any case. If this ministry is blessing you, you should be writing us. And we got a lot of beautiful letter, a four-page letter this week from a man that's incarcerated to talk about how he's been watching us for two years. You know, if you're incarcerated, write me a letter. If you're sitting by yourself in your home, write me a letter and say what this ministry is doing for you. Amen. Praise God and become a regular financial partner with this ministry. Also, I preach for over an hour today and you only see about 28 minutes or less on TV. Uh, if you'd like to see this entire message, you can watch it on YouTube or listen to it on Spotify, a bunch of different things. Go to our website, mountainfaith.org. And then you can go to our YouTube channel. Uh, you can go to our different platforms and different channels and watch this for free. Amen. And if you have the ability, download it for free to your device and listen to it while you're driving around or whatever you're doing. Well, you know, uh, we'd like to see you also here in the sanctuary with us. Praise God. We are in the last days. Get together and congregate together. Be a living stone with us and come here if you're, uh, if you're sort of local and do it on a regular basis. We'd love to see you. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Well, this is Pastor Dave and Kathy Gonzalez saying, press into God. and he'll press into you. And we'll see you again here next Sunday Amen. at the mountain. Amen. Amen. Click subscribe. Click the thumbs up on our messages. Click the little bell. Get your friends saved. Get your family saved.